This evening we are turning to Hebrews chapter 13. This is the closing chapter of that magnificent book. And the writer gives us some very uh, specific and pointed, helpful commentary on how to live out the faith that he has been describing. Tonight we are focusing on verses 7 and 8. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this word. And we pray that as we examine and reflect upon it, that your spirit would guide and teach and give understanding. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. There is a great concern in our day and age about a phenomenon called moralism, especially in preaching and teaching, moralism can be a real danger. The moralizing minister tends to pick and choose from the scripture those passages and points which provide a moral lesson for his hearers. Do this, do that, be good, act as you are told. And at first glance, this type of preaching may seem pointed and bold, a much-needed corrective in a day of moral compromise. But the problem with moralistic preaching is that it fails to point us to Christ. It tends to function on a holy, horizontal, human plane with no reference whatsoever to the vertical component, to the Godward focus. Any preaching that neglects or ignores Jesus Christ is problematic. There's no way around that fact. So in reacting against moralistic preaching, some of the critics have gone to an opposite extreme. They suggest that you should never, ever, under any circumstances, hold up any human example for imitation. That is moralism, they say. But the truth is really somewhere in the middle. We can and we should use human examples but not apart from Jesus Christ. As Paul tells the Corinthians, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And this kind of approach is laid before us here in our passage this evening. As the writer of Hebrews urges us to imitate the faith of our leaders, and then very quickly and very properly points us to Jesus Christ who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So as we consider this passage, we're going to try to understand the import, but we're also going to seek to obey this passage here this evening. So I want to begin with an approach to church history. Then we're going to take a look at the exemplary ministry of John Calvin and finish with Lessons from Christ through Calvin. Here in this brief passage, we see three main figures with a fourth present in the background. The background person is the writer of this epistle. It was someone from the apostolic circle, but nobody really knows quite surely who he is. It could be Paul, it could have been someone else, we just don't know. The other main figures here are easy to identify. One of them is Jesus Christ. He's mentioned in verse 8 as the one who never changes. 
The second is the reader of the epistle, the you of verse 7. The third and final are the leaders who spoke the word of God to you. So we have Christ, we have the reader, and we have these leaders who spoke the word of God to you. And they would be faithful preachers, men who had declared the unerring and unchanging word of God to the readers. In the first century, that would include the apostles, as well as Apollos, Timothy, Titus, Stephen, and several others. For some of the original readers, it might even include the Lord Jesus Christ, if they had sat under his earthly ministry. In later centuries of church history, we could include such great men as Athanasius, Augustine, Tertullian, Chrysostom, Wycliffe, Huss, Luther, Calvin, Knox, Rutherford, Spurgeon, Ryle, Machen, Murray, Van Til, and more. And for us here at Grace Church, that host of worthies would include John Hilbelink, Jonathan Falk, Lawrence Ayers, and Ivan DeMaster. These have all been faithful men of God who have spoken God's word to God's people. The thrust of this passage has an impact on both ministers and people alike. Ministers must live exemplary lives. They must not only preach God's word faithfully, but they must live God's word in their own daily life. They must set an example. This is part of godly leadership. But I think the greater and more direct duty really lies with the people of God. It is our duty as God's people to actively remember our leaders. Long after they have gone to glory, they should live on in the memory of their congregations. These men not only provided leadership for us, but they spoke the word of God to us. How can we forget them? For me personally, I especially revere the memory of Pastor Walter Bowie of Jackson, Mississippi. What a great man of God and what a fine preacher he was. And just having sat under his ministry for several years, having enjoyed fellowship with him, having learned about preaching from him, his example is very fresh in my memory. Well, in addition to remembering them, we should also consider their conduct. In other words, look at their lives as much as we are able. And that means that we need to know them and to observe their choices, their behaviors, their commitments. We should listen to their words, but we should also examine their deeds. And as we watch them, we should take careful note of their faith, what they believe, and how that belief impacts the lives that they live. And so we're looking at their conduct with special emphasis on their faith. These are men of God. These are men of faith. And how does that faith look in their life? This will naturally produce a certain outcome, what the author calls the result of their conduct. So we're seeing not only how they live, but the fruit that they produce. We're seeing the good works that come from them, the predictable results of their commitments. As we take all of this in, we are enabled to imitate their faith, imitating them 
as they imitate Christ. Now let me be very clear, so you don't think this is moralism. There are things about every preacher that are not good and that should not be imitated. When there are areas of weakness and sin, we don't and we shouldn't emulate those things. So we're not saying that you just do what the preacher does regardless in all areas, in every aspect and respect. No, we look and we see where are they faithful? Where are they strong? Where are they true? Where are they living by their convictions? Those are the things that we really want to follow and imitate in our own lives. So let me now give you a very brief sketch of the exemplary ministry of John Calvin. You might wonder to yourself, in what way has John Calvin spoken the word of God to you, Pastor Brian? Does he really qualify according to this verse? And I would argue that he has often preached God's word to me via his commentaries. Most of Calvin's commentaries are actually the transcripts of his sermons and lessons which he taught to the people of Geneva. So his devoted assistants would write down notes of his sermons as he preached, which then became the basis and foundation for his commentaries on many books of the Bible. So I do count John Calvin as one of the most significant pastoral influences on my life. I have heard him teach through those commentaries. And so I remember Calvin, and I want you to know more about him too. John Calvin was born in Noyon, France, the son of an ecclesiastical lawyer. And because of this, young John had certain economic advantages in life, largely due to his father's connection to the Roman Catholic Church. When his father fell out of favor with the local Catholic officials, John's break with Rome began. During his years of study in Paris, young John began to hear Protestant teaching, the influences of Martin Luther. As Dr. Edgar mentioned, we don't know much about the time or the circumstances of his conversion. He only makes that one allusion to it in his commentary on the Psalms. But we do know that John Calvin was converted to Christ in a very dramatic fashion. Well, how do you know that? Since we don't have a record of his experience, we know it because of the results. He was a young humanist, and he was a brilliant man, but he was not a believer. But then what we see in his later life shows the marks of a dramatic conversion where he left all that he had stood for, all that he had been connected with, and he threw in his lot with the Protestant cause, and he lived for Christ the rest of his life. There was a conversion. Well, meanwhile, the authorities in France were growing alarmed at these increasing Lutheran influences. They began persecuting the Protestants. When John was mixed up in some Protestant activism in Paris, his name was suddenly known and his liberty was at risk. He fled from Paris and he began a journey that would lead him eventually to become a pastor, a preacher, and a theologian in Geneva, Switzerland. And along the way, Calvin made numerous friends, some of them very influential members of high society people who helped him, people who protected him at times, people who shared his zeal and encouraged him in the work of the gospel. At heart, John Calvin wanted to be a scholar, 
to live a quiet life surrounded by books. He was traveling to his desired academic haven when he stopped for the night in Geneva. His friend, William Farrell, that fiery red-headed preacher of Reformation theology, was also there in Geneva. And when he heard that Calvin had arrived, he sought Calvin out. In a somewhat overbearing manner, Pharrell argued that God wanted John to join the work of Reformation in Geneva as a co-pastor. And as Dr. Edgar described it, Pharrell threatened Calvin with God's displeasure if Calvin persisted in seeking the seclusion of a, solitary, of a scholarly life. And somewhat to his own regret, Calvin acquiesced to Pharrell's browbeating. For the next several years, Calvin remained there in Geneva, trying to advance the cause of reformation in that unruly city. It was a headache. Calvin clashed with the city council, who had jealously guarded their control over the church. Sometimes Calvin gave way to anger, and he showed his temper, which he would later regret. But some progress was made, and things were headed in a good direction slowly. But Calvin had some very powerful enemies in Geneva, people who were libertines, who wanted the freedom to live any way they want, to do anything they want, and yet to be considered faithful members of the church. So in that way, you can sin with impunity and still partake of the Lord's Supper, still be a church member. Calvin was having none of it. And so the struggle in those early years was severe, and it took a toll on Calvin. He was not only physically uh, affected by this, but it really hurt him emotionally. He was not the firebrand who just loved conflict and who couldn't wait for the next debate so that he could lock horns with his enemies. He was actually a somewhat shy and reserved and timid man and he fought when he was forced to fight, but that was not his natural bent. Well, finally, his enemies contrived to expel Calvin and Pharrell from Geneva. Somewhat relieved, Calvin resumed his journey, and he ended up in Strasbourg. There in Strasbourg, with his friend Martin Bucer, he had a quiet and peaceful ministry writing, preaching, pastoring, and recovering from his experiences in Geneva. When the city of Geneva realized their error and understood how much they truly needed John Calvin, he was not eager to return. They sent representatives to negotiate with him, and the representatives of the city council had to agree to Calvin's terms before he would resume his ministry in Geneva. Now just pause here and think about this. Could you imagine the city council of Sheboygan kicking me out and sending me packing so that maybe I traveled over to La Crosse, let's say, and lived a very contented, peaceful life in La Crosse. And then the city council of Sheboygan says, you know, we need Pastor DeYoung back. Let's send some of the city fathers to La Crosse to negotiate with him. And when they come, I say, look, I don't want to go back to Sheboygan, but if I do, here's my demands. I mean, it's just such a different world. So removed in some ways from our own experience. Well, Calvin did come back, and what followed were 23 years of mature, fruitful, faithful ministry. And it's those years 
his second stint in Geneva that we should really concentrate on when it comes to Hebrews 13, 7. What Calvin did from his return to Geneva in 1541 until his death in 1564 is most significant. We start with his work in preaching and teaching the Word of God. During those years, Calvin was, first and foremost, a preacher of God's Word. He preached not only on the Lord's Day from St. Peter's Church, but he also gave daily Bible lectures to those who would come to listen to him. Again, just pause and think about that. Preaching on the Lord's Day, and then daily lectures on the Scriptures. Now, from the commentaries, we can see that sometimes Calvin was sort of shooting from the hip during those lectures. It's not that he did an enormous amount of preparation always for those daily lectures, but still, he was working in the Scriptures, he was bringing the Scriptures to bear on people, he was teaching them to study and to understand the Bible. And by doing this, over those years, he covered large amounts of the Bible. And this is seen in the multi-volume commentaries that cover most of the Old Testament and much of the New Testament. And as Calvin taught these books, say like the book of Isaiah, it's not that he had a short paragraph or a few sentences to cover half of a chapter. He goes verse by verse. And in each one of the verses, he treats it thoroughly, fully, completely. So that by the time his commentary on Isaiah comes out, it is a five-volume commentary. And he did this over and over again. He was a very careful exegete of Scripture. He didn't read things into the text, but he drew truth out of the text. And by going verse by verse, he did what is described as a line-upon-line -line approach to the exegesis of Scripture. Now, when I buy a commentary for a book that I'm going to preach on, I can find out pretty quickly if the commentator is engaged carefully with the text or if he is kind of flying by the seat of his pants, giving broad, sweeping generalizations. And where I find commentators that have these kind of broad, sweeping approaches, I take that commentary and I put it on my shelf, and I don't look at it again. They're basically useless. The ones that really go into detail, that mine the text, that dig into the truth, that find and bring out the gems of truth, those are the ones that are most valuable. And that's what Calvin did. So he is a very careful and diligent student of Scripture. Calvin was also a writer. His most famous work is The Institutes of the Christian Religion, which he was constantly revising and improving and expanding. But he also wrote many other books, such as The Necessity of Reforming the Church, which is an excellent argument for why and how the church should be reformed according to biblical principles. Calvin was an avid correspondent, writing many letters and replying to letters received from his many friends around Europe. And he did not have a word processor where he could dash out an email and send it in a matter of maybe two or three minutes. He is handwriting all of these letters. And then he is posting them 
to the various correspondents. And because he became a recognized expert in theology and doctrine, he was getting questions from every corner of Europe as the Reformation was ongoing. Simply stated, Calvin used his pen for the glory of Jesus Christ. Calvin also had a pastoral interest in helping the poor and the needy. Because of the persecutions in France, Protestants were being driven out. And Calvin understood their practical needs. They were refugees. They had no way to support themselves. And so Calvin spearheaded diaconal projects to enable these refugees to carry on their trades and to make enough money that they could live comfortably in the city of Geneva. So here he is, himself a refugee from France, looking at his fellow refugees and saying, these are skilled workers, these are trained people, but they have no way to work. They need a means to provide for themselves. And he went to bat for them and helped to set up these guilds for them. He also sought to encourage and to comfort those who were imprisoned for their faith in France. He wrote pastoral letters to men and women who were suffering for Christ's sake. And you can find these letters, and they are very moving. He's obviously entering into their situation with compassion for them, and trying to help them to stay the course and be true to the faith. Calvin likewise led the way for the development of the academy in Geneva. This school was a combination of a seminary and a missionary training center. Most of the graduates of the academy went forth to preach the gospel throughout Europe, and especially they were sent to his native France. This was a very dangerous calling, and yet these men were zealous to proclaim the faith in France. They had great effects on that nation, but they also suffered greatly for it. Calvin's other interests include what might be called civic projects. Calvin helped to revise the Geneva Civil Code, so that the city would have more just law. He also redesigned their sewer system to promote sanitation. Now again, stop and think about that. What is a preacher doing designing a sewer system? He's a man of so many talents, so many interests, so much insight that he says, you know, having raw sewage in the streets is not good for the people of this city. And we need to find some way to deal with the sewage problems in Geneva. I've got some proposals. And so he works with the city council on these various civic projects. When the, the plague came through the city, Calvin ministered to the sick and the dying, a very dangerous task. And on top of all of this, Calvin had a missionary heart. It was under his oversight that a missionary settlement was established in Brazil, though the Roman Catholics there would quickly destroy it. There was also a Huguenot settlement that was established in Jacksonville, Florida. If you're ever on vacation in Jacksonville, go to the Fort Caroline reconstructed Huguenot Fort on the St. James River. So Calvin was no armchair ivory tower theologian, a man who wouldn't get his hands dirty. He was a man of great energy and even greater zeal. And what makes this all the more amazing is that Calvin was never ever a very healthy person. 
He suffered from all sorts of ailments, including gout, which was extremely painful. And when he had kidney stones, they put him on a horse to go knock those kidney stones loose. Ouch. His ill health would have held back lesser men, but it did not hold back John Calvin. He worked, he served, he persevered through suffering and pain, through discomfort and disease. Well, we could go on and on, listing more and more ways that he impacted both church and state, but let me close my brief sketch with this. John Calvin was an exponent of liberty. Dr. Douglas Kelly has written an excellent study called The Emergence of Liberty in the Modern World. And in his book, Dr. Kelly demonstrates how John Calvin's influence led to the establishment and promotion of liberty in Geneva, in France, in Scotland, in England, and in America. We are coming up on an election where we will go down to the polls and vote, and whoever wins will be in office and the transition of power will go as it has always gone in our country. And we have liberty. We don't live under a dictatorship. We don't have some oppressive state that has got its tentacles into every single area of life. We still enjoy much liberty. Where did it come from? Well, humanly speaking, it came from John Calvin. And his teaching and his influence, and his example. So as we remember Calvin, considering John Calvin's faith and the result of his conduct, what can we learn? What should we imitate from Calvin as he imitated Christ? Let me close with three lessons from Calvin. The first lesson is to be guided by the Word of God. The Word of God was a lamp to Calvin's feet and a light to his path. And as Calvin walked through this world in the light of God's Word, it illumined his way forward even when times were very, very dark. As I've read Calvin's writings, it has been abundantly clear to me that John Calvin knew and loved and studied the scriptures. He was a student of God's word first and foremost. And in many ways, this explains the remarkable results that Calvin enjoyed throughout his life and after he was gone. John Calvin was a man of the book. He read his Bible. And what an encouragement that is to us. As good Calvinists, if you will use that term, we're to be people of the Bible. We don't have some concocted system based on philosophy or even based on theology. We're people rooted in the scriptures. And we're going again and again to the Bible and saying, what does God say in his word? You want to find the real heart and secret of Calvinism. It's this. What does the Bible say? What does God's word tell us? And it's through the word of God that we have courage and conviction to believe and to live but it's the Word of God that is our foundation because that's how Calvin taught us. And looking back to Christ, we see in our Savior a thoroughgoing knowledge of the Scriptures. How often we hear from Jesus' lips, have you never read? As it says in the Scriptures, the Savior kept on going back to the Old Testament because he loved the word of God. And so Calvin is just imitating Christ and Christ's love for the scriptures. The second lesson from Calvin's life is the value of thinking deeply on the things of God. 
Calvin's mind was full of God and truth. Calvin dedicated much of his substantial brain power to considering what God had revealed in his word, both in specific details of particular passages and in the broad sweeping truths of the scriptures. Reading through the Institutes, you discover insights that are derived only from deep, sustained, serious thought, aided and directed by the Holy Spirit. Calvin was a thinker, and we need more serious thinking in our own day and age. One of the things that is uh, so obvious and so grievous is the superficial nature of so many Christians who don't think deeply about anything at all. And as they're just kind of living their lives, trying to get by, not stressing their brains too much, they're settling for far too little. They've got so much in the scriptures. If you take it in, if you cogitate on it, it produces deep, profound conviction. It leads you to principles that guide and govern your life. So that means that we have to push away a bit from the frantic, frenetic pace of our culture to find time to think and to contemplate. Well, then finally, John Calvin cared for the world around him. He cared deeply. He's portrayed as this austere, kind of grim, grumpy, uh, Calvinist in the worst sort of the the sense of that term. He was really a very warm-hearted, generous, gentle person. Whether it was helping out his fellow French refugees or sending church planters into France, or missionaries to Brazil, whether it was revising the law code of the city of Geneva or redesigning their rotten sewer system, Calvin cared. He was engaged. He was a man who had concerns for his fellow human beings. Now, often in our day and age, there is a dichotomy that is presented to us of kind of the egg-headed intellectual Christian who may be doctrinally correct, but is basically disengaged from real-life problems, and the very uber-compassionate liberal Christian who is just bleeding compassion and cares so deeply, and those two things are posed as opposites. So either you're this mindless heart, or you're this cold intellect. But what we see in Calvin is a sanctified intellect and a deep heart of compassion for his fellow man. And that shows us that if we're going to really follow his example as he followed Christ, yes, we need to think deeply, but we also need to care deeply for the world in which we live, for the people that are all around us. Now, you may go to work tomorrow morning, and just in your kind of chit-chat with a coworker, find out that they've had some devastating event happen in their life recently. Maybe there was a car accident where they lost a loved one, or maybe they've been notified that their job is going to be terminated, or maybe they've been diagnosed with some very grave disease that could be life-threatening. There are people all around us who are carrying burdens on their hearts. Do we as thinking Christians care about them? And do we care enough 
to do what the Good Samaritan did, to go out of our way, to stop, to help, to care for them, even at our own great expense. Because that's what Christ has done for us. And that's what Calvin did in his day and age. And that is what we are called to do as well in our world. There's one other lesson which I can add to what I have said. Calvin loved the Lord's Supper. In fact, he loved the Lord's Supper so much that he fought the council, the city council of Geneva. They wanted to say that anyone who was basically a citizen of Geneva was allowed to come to the Lord's table, regardless of their lifestyle. And Calvin knew good and well that some of those people, some of those citizens of Geneva, were deeply immoral people. And Calvin protested and said, first of all, this is the church's domain. It's not the domain of the city council. And secondly, we cannot allow just anybody to come to the Lord's table. Well, some of, some of his enemies wanted to make a test case of this. So some of the most scandalous of those people proclaimed that they were going to come to the Lord's table and they expected to be served by Calvin. And Calvin basically said, over my dead body. And the city council didn't like that too much. That was part of the dispute that got him expelled. But Calvin cared very deeply about the Lord's Supper. He knew this is a means of grace. And in his writing and in his teaching, Calvin developed a distinctive position of the Lord's Supper, which was different from the Roman Catholics and their transubstantiation. It was also different from the consubstantiation position of the Lutherans. In fact, this was a point of dispute between Calvin and his followers and Luther and his followers. So what did Calvin say about the Lord's Supper? Calvin basically taught that the Lord's Supper has the real presence of Christ, but that real presence is not physical, corporal, or carnal. It is a spiritual presence. And so Christ comes to us in the sacrament spiritually, not physically. Now, Rome, and to some extent the Lutherans, said, oh, there's a physical presence. And Calvin said, no, there can't be a physical presence. That's not what Scripture teaches. It is rather this spiritual presence so that we partake by faith and we eat of Christ spiritually, not physically. Another contribution of Calvin on the sacraments generally and on the Lord's Supper in particular is he said, look, these are signs and seals of the covenant of grace. Calvin was really the first theologian to connect the sacraments with the whole concept of covenant. So as Calvin taught these things, they came down to the English Puritans. They were enshrined in our Westminster standards and they are the basic doctrinal positions of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church and of our particular congregation. We don't believe that you are going to physically eat Jesus' body in just a minute, or that you're going to physically imbibe Jesus' actual blood. We, we believe these are signs and seals, and that you will partake of these things spiritually, really and truly, but spiritually. And that means that the Holy Spirit, in just a few moments, is going to take and use these elements for your spiritual nourishment and for your growth in grace. So that as you, in just a few minutes, partake of these elements by faith, the Holy Spirit is using them to strengthen your faith. So that as you leave this sanctuary tonight and go out into a world 
that will challenge you, that will provoke you, that will test you at every turn. You are doing that in the power of Christ, mediated by the Spirit through the sacraments and the invisible spiritual presence of Christ. And so we are very much indebted to Calvin for his clear thought and his biblical understanding of this sacrament. The sacrament is for those who have professed faith in Christ and are members in good standing of a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church. So if you're a communing member of your church where your membership is, you're welcome at our table. But it is not a sacrament for those who are living scandalous.